All right, hello everyone, this is John, and today I'm gonna to do a three-part series on how to do longitudinal multi-level modeling in our studio. Uh, this will be a step-by-step -step process. In the first video, I'll begin by putting together the basics of your model, which would involve the unconditional means model. This is the null model. It'd be testing the null hypothesis that your intercept is significantly different from zero. You wouldn't be testing your hypothesis at this stage in the model, but it's a good starting point because it's really going to be the, the basic raw elements of your model, which you'll later build upon. And that's exactly what I'm going to do in the next video, video two. I'll be doing the unconditional growth model, which will be setting up the slope. I'll show an example of the different types of slopes uh, being fixed or random. And based on the data that I'm using, I'll show you the difference between the two, whether a fixed slope or random slope is better. And then finally, in the last video, video three, I'll be putting together the conditional growth model or the full model. And this is the model where you'd be really testing your hypotheses and research questions. This is where your predictors would be included in the model and tested for model fit amongst the DV. So um, I want to quickly go over the research question involved um, in this tutorial. I will not be pers I will not be tackling this research question. Uh, within this video as this is including predictors that I will not be adding into the model just yet. Uh, but let me begin. Uh, a research team wants to determine how much a four session on the job training will improve employees job related task performance. The on the job training took place at two different job sites and employees rated their satisfaction with their trainer and rated their overall job satisfaction as well. So I've color coded uh, a few key variables within this statement to just highlight which ones are the outcome, dependent variable, repeated measure, and predictors slash independent variables. Uh, so to begin, the outcome variable is going to be job performance uh, or job related task performance. Uh, this was something that was measured after each day of training and individuals have different values for them. And that's going to be the dependent variable in this study. Uh, the repeated measure is the amount of days of training an individual took part in. Here it says once a week for four weeks, but as I'll show momentarily, not all individuals completed the four uh, weeks of training or the four training sessions. And then finally, uh, the independent variables will be job site, satisfaction with trainer, and overall job satisfaction. We just want to include these in the model to see whether it mattered what job site you took the training to see if it changed your performance but then we want to see whether the satisfaction with the trainer in uh, altered your performance or perhaps it's just how much you really like your job that'll impact job performance itself so as I was mentioning this is a longitudinal study and includes a sample of 40 employees uh, but here I just want to show you an example of what a longitudinal study might look into and what someone might run into especially in a longer study, especially over four weeks. Um, so you can see here I've copied little windows, little snippets of individuals from the study um, from job site one and job site two. You can see along the uh, Y axis here that individuals did not all complete the four days of training. Some completed four, some completed three, two, one, etc. Um, very common thing to happen in longitudinal uh, studies. Uh, levels of attrition can be relatively high, but the nice thing is with multi-level uh, modeling, uh, you can account for all these individuals. So if an individual only completed one day, they can still be added. If they complete three days, they can still be added. Um, in some other uh, methods, such as repeated measures ANOVA, you require all cases to be completed. But if we were to take that approach with this type of data, you would see really quickly we'd lose a lot of the information we have available to us. So and that's why in this case, multi-level modeling is a pretty good approach to take. So uh, the first step is going to begin with the unconditional means model. As I was previously mentioning, you're not really testing any of your hypotheses at this moment in time, but you're just beginning to build the model. And what you're really looking at is to see how much the grand mean or intercept differs from zero or from baseline. So you're really rejecting the null model that you really don't have anything to actually measure within the model itself. So pretty much the way it's going to look is something like this. You have no slope, meaning there's no line across your plot. 
you have no x-axis because you're not including any predictors or length of time at this point but you're just looking at overall job performance to see where its intercept would differ from zero so let's jump on over to R and we're going to go to test the null hypothesis how much does the grand mean for the intercept differ from zero so first thing is to add the data into R um, as you can see in the global environment, I've already included it, so I can open it. Um, a few things to mention right from the get-go. You can see the data is in long form, meaning individual one. You can see they represent one more than one row, um, or as you can see, and they have multiple uh, days of training involved with different um, values attached to each day of training. Uh, you want your data into long form as represented here. Uh, but at the same time, when it comes to your time points, uh, you want to begin with zero. So technically, day, training day number one, training day number two, and training day number three are labeled zero, one, and two. You want to begin with zero because that is pretty much you setting a baseline for your intercept. Um, if you have any other number here, such as one or a different value, the idea is you could be potentially skewing your results because now you've immediately put a numeric value that is greater than zero or that much further away from baseline. So it's a good practice to put all those values um, from zero and add them from there. So training day one is zero, training day two is one, and training day three is two. So now that we have that covered, we can begin uploading the uh, multi-level modeling package we're going to use. And that package is called the NLME package. So if you do not have it, um, install it. But if you do, you can click library and run it. And now it is open. Of course, there is other multi-level modeling packages available, such as LME4. Oops, did not mean to do that. Um, such as LME4. Uh, but that is not going to be explored within these tutorials, but definitely something worth checking out. So something I always like to do is just look at the headers of the data just to see what I'm working with. Make sure all the labels are what I was expecting. So you have job site, ID, days of training, job performance, which is our dependent variable, satisfaction of trainer, and job satisfaction. All looks good. So now we can begin putting together our model. And the model we're putting together is the unconditional means model. And what we're going to be doing is putting ID as the nested variable and random effect. So what that pretty much means, if I look down below, because this is a longitudinal study and individuals completed more than one day of training, or hypothetically they did, um, you want individuals to be nested within themselves. So all individuals are nested within themselves. So their time periods or their time sets will be compared to, uh, to one another. Um, and then, of course, we want to add our dependent variable into the model. So here it is, job performance. Um, it's going to be in your model right at the get-go, so you might as well get it in there. And then you have ID as, core, of course, the nested variable. But right now, we have no slope. That's where that one is. And we technically don't have any real random effects either at this point. Nothing being accounted for. Um, for this method, I'm using maximum likelihood. There is other methods to use, but that's the one I'm using for this. So I could run now the model. Uh, I highlight that plus summary mod one and run it. And here are some of the results right from the get-go. Um, right at the beginning, we have the log like value. Here it is negative 179.752. All that is suggesting is that this model has a value. And if you start building upon your model, you can start comparing the log like to each other to see how much your model is improving in fit. Ideally, you would want this number to be decreasing each time you add something new to your model as you're hoping to actually improve the fit of your model. So you'll see in the next two videos, the log like for the other values will slowly start to decrease. And then we can test whether this decrease is significantly different from the original model. Now, the next step is to look at the random effects. We have uh, the uh, standard deviation intercept and standard deviation residual. These values are important because they're going to help us to calculate the intra-class correlation coefficient. This value is going to pretty much tell you how much clustering could and potentially exist within your data and sort of provides you that merit to begin multi-level analysis right from the get-go. We'll test this near the end of the video to see what that value is. 
Uh, but some things to point off right away and some things people might want to look at right when running this analysis is the fixed effects. So we're looking at job performance here with no slope technically, but as you can see, the p-value is significant. And what this value is pretty much telling you is that um, you have an intercept here, 5.052253, and that is significant. So for job performance, your grand mean or intercept is 5.052253, and it significantly differs from zero. And I can really show you quickly what that would look like. So as again, as I was mentioning, there's no x-axis, there's no slope, but here is your intercept. Here it is roughly, and this is how much it differs from zero, which is technically significant. Um, some other things to point out is you have your standard error here, um, and I'm going to show you how to get the intervals momentarily. But of course, if I go a bit further, number of groups equals 40. Yes, there was 40 individuals that took part in the study. And the observations differ. And this observation of 98, it just means some individuals did one day of training, some did two days of training, some did three days of training, etc. So at this point, right from, the, um, from everything we've analyzed, we can start uh, making some important notes about this model. Uh, number one, we can reject the null model because the intercept is significantly different from zero. Uh, but some things to mention is that um, we're measuring a grand mean here. So regardless on what time, uh, what training day individuals did or how many training days they did, we're measuring all those at once. So time is not being measured in this model. So right now it's not longitudinal. And of course, we have no predictors in the model either, no independent variables predicting the dependent variable. But let's go down to step five and now run the intervals. You can click run. And here they are. They provide the 95% confidence intervals uh, for this model. Here's that value from above, 5.052253 for fixed effects and job performance. It has its lower estimate and its upper estimate. If we go above, we know that is significant. It significantly differs from zero. So we know that this confidence interval is significant. And roughly all that would look like is something like this. Our standard error, our upper and lower limits, which are significant and significantly differ from zero. Uh, some things to mention that uh, could be a little confusing to some is that under the random effects here, it has confidence intervals as well. And what these confidence intervals are suggesting is that individuals do vary. So not all individuals move at the same pace. Some might move up, some might move down. Uh, but this is actually significant. And what's tricky here is um, this R package and a few packages that measure multi-level analysis in R Studio don't actually provide a significance test here. So the best way for you to interpret these types of values is to just make sure that this lower value is not negative. Meaning if this was below zero, this was a negative value, and these two values are positive above zero, that would suggest the confidence interval is not significant. But we will see that in some cases this might be negative and these two might be negative, meaning they're below zero, but they're all below zero, that is significant. It's just when it's sort of sitting on that cusp on the threshold of zero, which would suggest it's not significant. But here it's saying it is significant, suggesting there is individual variability and there is much more variability to be measured within our model. So the last thing we want to do now is calculate that intra-class correlation coefficient for the unconditional means model. As I highlighted above, here it is here. You have to manually calculate it to get the value, but you can see I've already plugged in all the numbers here. Make sure to square them, and we can run it. So uh, just before running it, I want to suggest uh, mention is that... Um, any value that's below 0 0.05 would suggest that clustering is not taking place. So really, we want to see how large our ICC value is because the larger the value, the more indicative it is of potential clustering taking place, which would technically give us the go-ahead to actually perform further multi-level modeling on this data. So let's run it. And lo and behold, it is 0.49, so almost 50% uh, 
uh, more variability exists, which is pretty much saying there is a large amount of clustering that is taking place. And now we need to flush it out by, uh, by selecting a proper slope and then by hopefully using our predictors to see how much of that variability we can account for. So that is pretty much how to run the unconditional means model. As I was mentioning, you're not testing any hypotheses at this point. You're really just looking to see how much that interval differs from zero. And you can then use things such as the intra-class correlation coefficient to see whether you should proceed with multi-level modeling. Um, like I said, if the value is below 0 0.05, it would suggest that maybe clustering is not taking place within your data. So definitely worth checking out. Um, so to sum it up, the intercept was significant. We can reject the null model that it does not differ from zero. And based on our fixed effects and random effects showing a lot of variability um, within its intervals, we can proceed now to adding a slope to the data. Stay tuned for the next video. Thank you for watching.